If you go to a, a solo vocal recital, you're going to hear probably one of two kinds of works. One is that you will hear arias that have been taken out of, of operas and oratorios and cantatas. But the other thing that you will hear is a, moder a modern invention, now that we're in the Romantic period, called the art song. Or the German term for that is lead, and the plural is leader. So all those terms apply to the same thing. We're talking about exactly the same type of music. So an art song is a piece of music, a vocal music, for a trained singer. This would not have been intended for you and I to sit around our house and, and sing songs. So, trained singer with piano. You'll remember if an aria or a recitative from an opera would have been performed with opera, with an orchestra. So, in this case, it's with piano. Now, when you go to a recital, you may also hear those arias played with piano because they can't afford to bring a whole orchestra in to play for their recital. But you'll know that it's an art song if it was really intended to be performed with piano. So, trained singer with piano. In the Romantic period, composers had tons of poetry to choose from. They're, you know, poets are just really productive during this period of time. So you might hear the same poem set by multiple composers. In fact, there's, there's a, a great database that has the, the translations for all those different kinds of things, and you can put in the name of a poem, and it'll tell you all the different composers who took that poem and set it to music. So. You, a really good poem you might hear in 10 or 12 different versions and that's a really kind of cool process if you wanted to go look and um, you know, see how people treated it and we're going to do a little bit of that here in just a minute. So a composer has choices. They've got their text, they know they have a singer, they have a piano. Now what are they going to do? There are two basic approaches that a composer might take to setting a poem. Now poems generally come in stanzas so they have sort of regularly recurring patterns. One thing that a composer might do is to make the, the music the same for every single verse of the poem. So just no matter what happens, the song is always the same. We call that strophic form, where the, verse, the, the melody is always the same no matter what's happening. Let's take an example from folk music and, and see how that can play out in some interesting ways. Oh, my darling Clementine. In a cavern, in a cavern, excavating for a mine, left a miner, a 49er, and his daughter, Clementine. That's our tune. So that's our first verse. Then we have the chorus. Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling, Clementine, you are lost and gone forever, dreadful sorry, Clementine. Exactly the same tune. We just have some different words. All right, so that's kind of a cheerful tune, right? You know, it just sort of bounces along, and, and, and even if I sang it slower, it would still be sort of a, a bouncy little song. So why are we sorry about Clementine? I and mean, what happened to Clementine? Why, why are we dreadful sorry about her? Well, if you go through all the rest of the verses of this song, you will learn that, that Clementine had some pet ducks, and that every day she would take them down to the water to, for their little, you know, for ducky time. And then in one of the verses later in the song, she actually falls in and drowns. So that's why we're dreadful sorry about Clementine. But we never get any sense of that from the tune itself because it's like da 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 da. You know, it doesn't sound like something horrible happened to her, but in fact, it did. That's what can happen with a strophic piece. The, the music itself is not helping us to understand anything about the emotions that happen in the poem. So strophic form repeats itself. We're going to listen to an example of an art song now that's in strophic form. This is by Robert Schumann, who was a um, composer, obviously in, in the Romantic period, who um, was actually a pianist. Uh, he was at the same time period as Liszt and Chopin, who were like the big showmen of the time. And he was always trying to improve himself physically to, to, as a pianist, and he was kind of just disturbed that his hands weren't as big as Liz because Liz had this huge like wingspan of fingers and could play massive notes. So he did some experimenting with some things and in the process managed to, to injure his hands and was no longer able to play the piano. He also suffered from auditory hallucinations. So he heard, not, he didn't hear voices, he heard music, which might be good if he was composing it, but it also um, made him a little crazy. He actually tried to, to drown himself. Um, so he had a tough life. He was married to Clara Schumann, whom we will look at when we look at piano music from the period of time. And so um, she had a kind of a tough life. She was taking care of a man who was gifted, but also 
disturbed, and I think they had eight children or something, and so she had a rough life. Um, but we're going to listen to one of his art songs called Ich Grola Nicht, which means I bear no grudge. So in this poem, the, the singer is talking to someone he loves who has broken his heart, and he's just saying, you know, I, I bear no grudge. You know, I'll, I forgive you for all the things you have done to me. Uh, it's really okay, and and off we go. So as you listen to it, listen to the, to the piano part in particular and to the inflections of the singer, and think about the message that Schumann is trying to give us about that text about I bear no grudge. So go listen to that now. All right, so now you've heard a strophic piece, Ikrola um, Nick. I hope you found that Schumann was actually uh, sort of snidely saying in his music there that he really did bear a grudge. You get a sense from the way that that piece is constructed that this singer is not being gracious in his lost love, that this is, I really am angry at you, and that then the music sort of sends that message to you. We're going to look now at two versions of the same poem. One of them is an extremely famous um, setting of the, po of the poem, and the other you may not have heard of before. The poem is called Erlkönig, which means the Earl King, it's, and this is a German character, um, folk character. Uh, I once had a German woman in my class who said that she, that she had knew this story from when she was a child, and it always kind of gave her nightmares, and that this piece was scary for her, so that'll give you a sense of the of the kind of character we're talking about. So in this poem, which is by Goethe, who is a, like one of the big names of German poetry, we have the Earl King, who is um, sort of like a grim reaper, if you want to look at it from that perspective. We have a man and his son. So we have three characters here who are actually participants in the story. And then we have a narrator. But all of these roles are being sung by the same singer, because this is a piece for a solo singer with piano. So the singer has a really tough job here, but they have, they have to be able to represent the narrator, we have to re represent the father, the son, and the Earl Koenig. So um, the, the music itself ha has to be reflective of that. So if you imagine in terms of um, the kinds of voices that these characters would have, the son would have a high-pitched voice, so normally that's that would be written up in a higher range of the voice so it sounds like a younger person, and then the father would be deeper. The Earl King, his voice changes depending on what's happening in the story, as you'll see as we listen to the piece. So what is the story? We have the father and the son, and they are galloping through the woods because the son is ill, and he is trying to get him to to the doctor. And as they, they fly through the woods on the horse, the, the child keeps seeing the Earl King, so he's seeing death out there. And he keeps, you know, like, oh, father, you know, father, father, I see him out there, or, um, you know, his, his hands are brushing on my face, and the father say, oh, no, no, no that's, just, that's just the mist in, in the woods that you're feeling, or those are just the branches on the trees. And he, he keeps trying to explain away what the child is seeing. Um, at the end, the child is, has actually died, so it's a very sad piece at the very end. So I want you to listen to two different interpretations of this really powerful poem. The first is by Louis Spohr, who was actually born Ludwig Spohr, and I couldn't figure out, can't find why he changed his name, so that, that might be a mystery somebody could explain to me, uh, who's a German composer who is right in that transitional period between the classic and the romantic period. But you know, this is a very short period, so everything had to be sort of fast anyway. So we have his setting of this particular poem. And then I want you to listen to the very famous version of it by Franz Schubert, who also was in that transitional period. And Schubert didn't live very long. I think he was in his 30s when he died. So uh, he just sort of crossed over the period and uh, did, did a lot of wonderful music. He wrote like 600 art songs. He was a busy man while he was alive. But this ver his version of the Earl Kern Kernig is the very famous one that um, you would hear if it, somebody said, oh, I heard that piece, that would be the one we're talking about. So I want you to listen to those two pieces and think about not only how the vocal part works and how the composers make it so that you can tell the difference between the narrator and the man and his son and the Earl King, but how does the piano part help or not help the story? 
And this is a dramatic story. You know, we're running through the woods and we have scary things in the woods. We have a frightened child and a father who's trying to soothe him. And we have the Earl King who actually speaks. And it's like, come with me, come with me. You know, he's uh, like, you know, I've got candy for you kind of approach to getting, luring the child to go with him. So um, think about how the composer works all that and see which one you like better? I'm not, I'm not going to say one's better than the other. They're just different. So see how these two different composers take exactly the same text and do something different with it. Now, I, I did say you know, there were two things that you could do. One was to be strophic. The other is what we call through-composed music. So in a through-composed piece, the composer is going to change the music to reflect what's happening in the story. So it won't be just the same old, same old, same old melody as the piece goes along. So as you're listening to these two versions, also think about that. Does the composer use the same melodic structure throughout, strophic, or does he take the music and do something different with it to reflect what's happening in the poem, which would be through composed. So enjoy the two versions of The Earl King, one by Louis Spohr, one by Franz Schubert. <laughs> 